Beat Cancer, the official podcast of the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thanks for joining us today as we have in-depth discussions of the science, research, and advancements taking place at our National Cancer Institute designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm Chris Joyce. And I'm Stephanie Wynn. We will also examine proactive approaches to cancer prevention, and most importantly, how we are breaking barriers to beat cancer in our community and beyond. Joining us today is Dr. David Copenhaver, an anesthesiologist and chief for the Division of Pain Management. His specialty is cancer pain management, and that's why we're talking to him today. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Copenhaver. Thank you, Stephanie, very much. Pain is a reality with so many cancers, um, Dr. Copenhaver. What are some of the most promising new breakthroughs that you're seeing in terms of managing the pain that comes with uh, the disease as well as treating the disease? Well, these are. this is kind of almost a fundamental question, existential one almost. Um, you know, I might, I might say that we would start, Stephanie, with just briefly – that pain management in really its fundamental form um, uh, really started with cancer-related pain. And it kind of broke away from that into chronic pain. And I'll I'll just, I'll I'll kind of give a brief service announcement of anesthesiology and how it related to pain and then subsequently cancer-related pain. So, if I was to encapsulate this quickly, I would tell you that there's something unique and special about anesthesiology in the sense that it's uniquely American. Now, not that we're in this podcast to talk about patriotism or all kinds of interesting uh, um, uh, concerns for, for national pride, but what I would tell you uh, is uh, w- there is a really special thing. It's a story that goes into understanding um, inhaled gases the uh, use of an anesthetic, which would balance pain relief, um, immobility because of the objective of surgery, and then subsequently the understanding of being able to render someone not conscious necessarily of what's going on, all encapsulated in a in a thought of what is anesthesia. It became the anesthesiologist's charge at that time that after a surgery, now this occurred, now we could say that to put this on the timeline, this was in, um, I'll give the October 16th of 1846 was the first anesthetic in Boston. So some would argue 1842 in Atlanta, but we're not going to mince or splice words here. There's a couple of founders, but needless to say, um, in the 1840s. Before that, you can imagine that surgery really was problematic without anesthesia. Um, And subsequent to that, there was a lightning rod of um, uh, a plethora, if you will, of surgeries being performed in the 1850s, 1860s, but really going out into the 1900s and as anesthesia was more prevalent. Pain as as a phenomenon in the setting of controlled injury, which is what is surgery, really allowed for anesthesiologists to participate in this domain because they were seeing on a routine basis pain subsequent to surgery. So it fell into the lap of the anesthesiologist, but with no special training. And it wasn't until the late 50s, early 60s, that an anesthesiologist with all humility named John Bonica um, at the University of Washington suggested that Physicians, like anesthesiologists, were not uniquely suited to pain, to to study it or to to treat it. That pain was such a broad phenomenon, encapsulating so much in in a rich experience that it required psychiatrists, internists, it required physiatrists, physical medicine doctors, neurologists, if you will, surgeons, um, acupuncturists, nutritionists, that it's such a broad encapsulating concern that Largely, uh, this was all should be part of a comprehensive, thorough pain strategy. Um, So if we move from that into understanding cancer-related pain uh, from the 60s um, into the 70s, there was a definition for what is pain. 
And maybe I should mention what is pain and how we describe it as, as humans in our lexicon uh, as to the nomenclature. Pain is an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience. And it's sensory and or emotional with actual, or here's the real kicker, potential tissue damage. Meaning it doesn't, we may not be able to see that tissue damage necessarily, and then, or described in terms of such damage. That's been the definition since the 70s, uh, as described by the International Association for the Study of Pain. So then, not to be evasive, Stephanie, but to answer your question, cancer then came about where, how could we utilize all these skills and what we've learned in the setting of the burgeoning uh, anesthetic and controlled surgery experience, experience and parlay that into the experience of cancer. And that's really where uh, medication management and other strategies were placed. And in the 80s, from where that definition stood firm as the definition of what is pain into the 80s with the World Health Organization, that was the first attempt globally to look at cancer and pain. And they created an analgesic stepladder, meaning what could be used at step one, what could be used at step two, and then what could be used at step three as a basic Julia Child's recipe to help individuals that were dealing with pain globally. And it started with, with that. Now, subsequent to the 80s and the use of the analgesic ladder as promoted by the World Health Organization, there have been incredible advancements associated with oncologic care. And what I could say is that we are victims of our own success. We're living longer, and we're living longer with incredible disease, and having disease go into remission, which is an absolute f phenomenal achievement. That said, some of our therapies, whether they be surgery, radiation, chemotherapeutics, do have secondary side effects that can allow for, for persistent pain to take hold. And there are several strategies to address those types of pain uh, that are now part of our cancer pain and supportive care matrix. So that's where we find ourselves today. Do you, um, with each of those types of, of pain from whether it be chemotherapy or surgery or any of these, are, do you, are there different strategies for each one? And then kind of, if you could tell us kind of in a roundabout way, I don't know if you can go into each specifics or not, but what, what does that mean for a patient? Like if I, if I'm dealing with chemotherapy as my treatment and then I'm experiencing pain after what, how can you help or how can your department help me or what are, you know, some of the strategies within that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think as we become more and more sophisticated and precise, uh, we've been able to formulate strategies for each type of condition. I'll just give the service announcement that some types of surgery are well known to cause chronic pain. Mm. So thoracotomy, there's a well-known post-thoracotomy related pain syndrome. Uh, for example, after um, breast resection, unfortunately for cancer, there's well-known incidents of a neuralgia or nerve pain that can occur, uh, intercostal brachial neuralgia. Um, similarly, for many chemotherapeutics, there is the idea that there can be chemotherapy-induced neuropathy or nerve pain associated with chemotherapy. And I think Let's start there with chemotherapy-induced neuropathy because chemotherapy can be applied to many different types of cancer. Um, and for the types of chemotherapy that, that can be given, there are some that are more provocative in causing injury uh, to peripheral nerves. So the first step is um, why chemotherapies, by and large, are a toxin, and they're a toxin to try to limit the uncontrolled doubling or development of cancer cells. But there's some unique things that we've learned in the more recent years about our human body that helps us understand how to treat um, 
chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. So along the spine in our central nervous system and our spinal cord, there are these small, the, the central spinal cord, and as you go away from the spinal cord to the nerve roots, like let's say, for example, the nerve roots that encompass the nerve roots that go to the leg and foot, as you leave the spinal cord, there's each nerve root has a small onion bulb. That small onion bulb is called the dorsal root ganglia. That dorsal root, people have talked about as it looks like a small onion bulb, is enveloped in what looks like a vascular network, a little enchilada, if you will, it's wrapped around the dorsal root. Um, it's been thought as a kind of a postulate, a hypothesis, that somehow as we were evolving uh, in the Darwinian experience, that these small dorsal roots, as they receive substantial blood flow from the systemic circulation, act as sentinels or alarm systems that were sipping, if you will, the systemic blood for any potential toxins and would actively absorb those toxins into the onion bowl, into the dorsal root ganglia, and actively do so in order to protect the cord, the central spinal cord, and the brain. So interestingly, there is a phenomenon where if you're provided toxins, in this case chemotherapy, and those chemotherapeutics are readily absorbed, they're actually absorbed preferentially in the dorsal root ganglia. We've learned now this is a unique story as it relates to UC Davis. Uh, that dorsal root, as we kind of examine it more specifically, uh, it turns out that all pain is transmitted on these wispy copper wires called C fibers. They're small, delicate fibers that transmit information into the dorsal root ganglia, into the cord, which we call the dorsal horn, up to the brain for it to be perceived. It turns out that for several years, uh, and we're talking over 60, 70, 80 years, the understanding of sodium channels, which are channels that distribute a electric charge, they allow for voltage to take place across cells and transmit electrical activity, that the human body was thought to have really two flavors. It wasn't 31 flavors, but two. Sodium, uh, the idea of tetrodotoxin sensitive and tetrodotoxin insensitive. So these two sodium channels were key. And tetrodotoxin is a toxin from a puffer fish. Now, that was sprinkled on sodium channels, and it would render some inactive and some not. Uh, uh, so it was a litmus test, if you will, and used in the lab. Um, what we've seen now is that with the Human Genome Project and several other things, the exciting story has unfolded where there are several sodium channels in the body, and of which we've learned and experienced from individuals who have never experienced pain. This is a group of individuals that are very rare to find, but they're congenitally insensitive to pain. So learning from this experience from these individuals, we've learned that there's one type of sodium channel that uh, one or two that are involved in pain transmission exclusively almost and they tend to be located on the dorsal root. So here I'm painting a story of the dorsal root being involved in chemotherapy, readily absorbing toxins because of its evolutionary relationship, and then an understanding of a specific sodium channel that's unique to pain. Uh, it turns out that at UC Davis, there's a, uh, a very dedicated effort um, across campus with the entomology department that studies bugs and arachnids, in particular a spider from the Amazon, a tarantula, that has a very unique toxin that can bind to this exclusive sodium channel uh, at the dorsal root. So the idea that there's new drugs that are coming of age with the understanding of tarantula toxin and then using that scaffolding to build a new drug. So UC Davis is in the process of actually homegrown development of understanding of pain at its most fundamental levels and then uh, utilizing this 
this particular uh, therapy for chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, for example. Now, that's a forward-thinking idea, but what do we do in our clinic? And I had to do that because the excitement in, in a podcast like this is I have to tell you all the amazing things we're doing, and maybe I jumped the gun with what's the future. Um, but I would tell you um, there are several medications that are used as anti-seizure drugs, but maybe couldn't stop a seizure to save their life because these drugs were not exclusive to that tempest electrical storm in the brain, but maybe found a home in the periphery of the body where we find that injured nerves in the periphery act like a mini seizure taking place in the periphery as opposed to the central nervous system. So they've been repurposed. And those medications can be utilized in addition to specialized uh, therapies that are in the antidepressant class, but are FDA approved for nerve pain. And then probably most, one of the more exciting developments is the use of specialized implantable devices. These are implantable devices that can be placed in the spine and distract the brain from pain and actually can disguise or alter the way we perceive pain from the periphery, our arms, hands, and legs, and feet. This type of therapy is called neuromodulation, modulation of the central nervous system. And uh, um, in this pursuit, there are a number of companies that have been developed that have developed devices that are helpful in the setting of nerve injury and can disguise alter the perception of pain from the periphery. So that's just a brief sample. There are oral medications, like I mentioned, and there are even aggressive uh, stimulator type devices, neuromodulatory devices that can be utilized. In a nutshell, when you look at patients and you see the reactions um, in, in certain cancer patients, perhaps they have the same type of cancer, what do you think is the most defining um, piece of information that can, um, you know, dictate whether they can uh, cope with that pain or uh, they're unable to co cope with that pain. I mean, what pain comes in all types and forms too. So what do you say to the cancer, someone who's newly diagnosed with cancer and facing the fears of, of go running into pain? No, it's a, another great question, Stephanie. I would say when I talked about John Bonica and his his view of pain being multidisciplinary as a multidisciplinary uh, event, it was key that that emotional quotient to pain uh, was substantial. So we have a pain psychologist in the and a social worker within the pain clinic, but we do assessments where we kind of understand that if we walk into having this this diagnosis, which can be a bombshell for people that are going through this. And we have an, you know, uh, an understanding where many of us as physicians were people. So we have loved ones that have gone through this. We understand to a certain degree, and some of us have even been afflicted. Um, ultimately, what I say is we bring all of this with love, respect, and humility to the clinic exam room. It may be that patients come or walk into the setting of having cancer, but having had a history of anxiety disorder, having had a history of prior mood disorder, having had other things go on in, in our lives. Our lives are complex and have lots of things that can occur. So we kind of take inventory in a pain psychology review as to how to customize a strategy for a patient. Uh, how to understand their history, comorbidities, other things that they've had in their lives, how that might potentially influence their care, how it can actually add to the resilience of their care sometimes, and how we can pull from that history to help them cope. So there are strategies using cognitive behavioral therapy, guided imagery, several other uh, strategies that can be employed in a pain clinic to help focus and bring all the wherewithal of the human body to allow them to circumvent pain.
oftentimes there can be um, and often to treat the pain itself. So for example, um, neuropathic pain in the setting of pain that may occur after surgery or uh, pain that may occur after chemotherapy. There are medications that can be used um, that, for example, um, gabapentin is a calcium channel blocker, an alpha-2 delta calcium channel blocker that basically can decrease the firing or frequency, characteristic frequency and firing of peripheral nerves, dampening or de allowing for a decrement of incoming pain information. Um, certain classes of antidepressants have dual FDA indication for both musculoskeletal pain and neuropathic pain in addition to mood. Now, when I mention this to patients, it kind of makes me feel like it's the old days of the Wild West and I have a top hat and I have this one drug that will cure all that ails you. And of course, the cork would come up and it was alcohol. But no, these particular medications are unique in the setting that antidepressants, specific ones that work for pain are serotonin, nor epinephrine, those two molecules, reuptake inhibitors. Now, if I gave a brief experience, that medication, as we, as we kind of, you know, if you were to walk across the floor and God forbid step on a tack, or in my house with young children, step on a Lego in the middle of the night that someone misplaced in the carpet, searing pain will shoot up through the foot, cross over into the cord, that inf information crosses over the freeway in the spinal cord, and then goes up to the brain where it's perceived. Um, there's obviously a reflex arc that then pulls your foot off of the Lego or the tack. And if it's dark, you quickly can't perceive everything that's down below your foot. So your brain in nanoseconds is trying to corroborate and triangulate what happened. In fact, sometimes there's quick flashbacks to when you were 12 running on a wooden dock, stepping on a rusty nail before you grab that rope swing and swing into the pond. It's almost like you're trying, the brain is trying to figure out what happened. As you flip on the light, look and you see the tack or the Lego, you kind of come to a realization, okay, there's a deep breath. Yes, there's a throbbing feeling, but then there's almost an attenuation or a decrease, although briefly, of the pain. The way pain comes into the body is through the, what we call the spine-brain highway, spinothalamic tract, comes right into the cord up to the brain. But as soon as it's perceived in the brain, there's another freeway that's enacted. It's often not described. It's our corticospinal tract or brain-spine highway. And that specific freeway attenuates or dampens incoming pain. It's the body's inherent ability, its own governor, to decrease pain. So, Sarah, and it runs off of high octane monoaminergic gas, serotonin and norepinephrine. So, if you increase enough serotonin and norepinephrine in, in certain real estate, in certain areas of the brain, it enhances our own ability already uh, to attenuate incoming pain. So in essence, um, it's helping our own body attenuate pain. And this is non-addictive? Yes. So um, we don't see with these particular um, anti-convulsant medications like gabapentin or SNRI, serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, uh, addiction uh, or that, that concern. And so they're utilized in the setting of neuropathic pain. Well, and that's a great that's a great a tie in there because we want to find out. I mean, we know that opioids are sometimes or maybe often prescribed for pain, but you have been doing you have an interest in non opioid treatments, and it sounds like some of these are that. So I wanted to find out, um, like, how often are the non opioid treatments the right choice for the patient, and are they preferable? No, that's a, a great segue. And I would tell you, we, we, as we kind of gave a brief interlude to the founding of anesthesia, the controlled concerns with pain, meaning controlled injury, and then subsequently um, uh, the idea of the consortium for pain understanding multiple disciplinary groups, and then the 80s cancer-related pain being an example. Um, the experience that in cancer-related pain was one that 
suggested yes, there was this analgesic ladder, a recipe for how to help treat cancer-related pain, which included acetaminophen, Tylenol, non-steroidals, anti-inflammatories. The idea of slightly stronger medications in the second step, which would be short-acting opioid or morphine-like products, and then stronger morphine-like products at the third stage. So it's almost from inception in the 80s that morphine and all of its forms or opioids had some role in the setting of cancer-related pain. And actually, it worked very well. Uh, opioids in the setting, uh, in that setting in the 80s, in the, in the beginning, uh, had there was benefit for cancer patients. Um, in a scenario where there was even more restrictions around opioids, there was kind of a, the door was slightly ajar and then opened for patients that were uh, suffering with cancer-related pain to get treatment. Now, the difficulty comes when that thought process was interpolated and then felt, well, we did pretty well with cancer-related pain. Doesn't this work for chronic non-cancer pain? And that's the story that we find ourselves where uh, there was excessive prescribing. Um, and we note that the increase was dramatic uh, and for several different variables and reasons. But suffice to say, in the early 90s, or we'll say the late 90s in 96 and 1996, the, the DEA is required, well, I'll say that the FDA requires that if you're an opioid manufacturer, you have to report how much opioid you're going to make for that year. So they can get a collective amount of, of, of how much opioids are going to be made. So in, in the late 90s, you could argue that there was about 97 milligrams of oral morphine per capita being made, meaning for every U.S. citizen, you could get your Social Security card in about almost 100 milligrams of oral morphine. Uh, that increased dramatically in 2007 to an increase of about almost 700 milligrams. So there was this vast, incredible increase. And the United States was consuming uh, a substantial percentage, let's just say greater than 50% of the world's opioid supply. It was a lot um, in terms of, of, of how we would deal with this. And largely, chronic pain was this effort to treat chronic pain and understand it and to treat it. Um, now, the difficulty with addiction, uh, which is really the continued use of a substance despite self-harm. So the idea that we continue to use a substance despite self-injury is really the focus on addiction. And opioids, uh, if we look at it from the chronic pain perspective, really provided benefit for some, but in mass, we started to capture that there were individuals that developed idiopathic or iatrogenic. They were being provided a substance and they had inherent gen genotypes for addiction. Uh, now, the data on cancer pain and, and our cancer population and our chronic non-cancer pain population and the risk of potential addiction or the risk of misuse or abuse of these types of drugs is actually very similar. Uh, and so the, the stewardship and being very careful with opioids is what's needed. It's not so much a moratorium. It's just that we need to be more sophisticated in how we prescribe them. And be more specific uh, about what are the criteria that help us use them, uh, which patients maybe whom in whom would be a there would be warning signs as to not use them and apply that principle just as easily from cancer to non-cancer. I know that the topic comes up a lot uh, around CBD, THC, marijuana involving uh, pain management. Is this something you can even speak to? Are we, um, you know, is there research being done in this area? Um, what type of treatments can you enlighten us? Oh, certainly. I think that, you know, what we've come to realize, similar with opioids, is that unfortunately the pendulum swings, and it's usually due to the human condition that um, 
something with overutilized, then there's a clawback and then very difficult to obtain opioid therapy or where well, really it should be a judicious, prudent, very cautious approach in the middle of selecting patients that make the best sense. And, and so opioids on one hand, marijuana on the other. So the idea that um, the classification for drugs as controlled substances in the Controlled Substances Act uh, suggests that um, marijuana is classified into a classification that serves no medicinal value. That's been the the uh, the conflict at the federal level. Um, now, why it occupies that position uh, would probably be a whole other podcast that we could talk about uh, why that's there. But suffice to say, that's been the suggestion from the Controlled Substances Act. Now, physicians receive their their the Drug Enforcement Agency license, their DEA license, to prescribe controlled substances from the federal government. But they're licensed to practice in their state by their state. So in the United States of America, in these United States, we have the states that have a relationship to the federal government and vice versa. And there are various uh, considerations. So in the setting of marijuana in general, and then we'll talk to CBD, speak to CBD separately, but as a cannabinoid or, or a separate agent that's from the plant, um, marijuana has been viewed as a substance that is in direct conflict to the DEA license. So a physician may be in a state where marijuana is has been voted by the good citizens of that state to be a-okay for both recreation or medicinal use, but the ability to prescribe controlled substances that comes from the federal government is in direct conflict in terms of its stipulations with the state. So where does this, where, where does the, the, the law stand on all this? And I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a humble Birkenstock wearing pain specialist, country pain doctor, but I would tell you that from my understanding is that there is constitutional law that suggests that's called the the supremacy clause. It says that in the Constitution, when it looks to state law versus uh, federal law, that whatever is the least risk, the least risky option, that the law should dictate what is the least risk. So when it comes to prescribing or not prescribing, that the view of its non-medicinal value is the most conservative and least risk, so therein lies the consideration. So what I would say is, the now the marijuana lobby would probably say the constitutional, the 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 uh, supremacy clause is unconstitutional, which that has been argued. But that said, that's where the prescribers lay uh, sit in in a place of limbo, a precarious location of really unclear understanding when it comes to this. I would say that during the Obama administration, there were no prosecutions that I could tell you of physicians that were involved with uh, um, guiding patients with marijuana. And then in during the Trump administration with Jeff Sessions as attorney general, there seemed to be an inclination to problematic concerns with the use of marijuana and legality associated with it. But that didn't transpire. Uh, it seemed like it was possible. Here we are um, uh, in the current administration with President Joe Biden that we don't see that same focus on this particular issue. Um, when it comes to marijuana, CBD, cannabinoids, the cannabinoid system is an elaborate system that in our body we have cannabinoid receptors. And cannabinoids are a portion of the plant uh, and they bind to those various um, receptors. Um, so. There is incredible medicinal value, I would tell you, from CBD products. And we're being enlightened each year with growing a growing list of potential targets or symptoms that they can treat with more and more research guided to help elicit and understand the data to guide patients and, and clinicians. Here at Davis, we have a burgeoning new cannabis research center at UC San Diego, there is the same. And there is 
substantial collaboration between the six UC campuses and medical centers on this particular effort. One thing that I've learned recently uh, is that the Cancer Center is trying to get uh, patients ready for whether it's surgery or chemo or radiation. Um, what, you know, let's say I'm a cancer patient and I'm going into, you know, I've had the diagnosis, I'm going into treatment, going into surgery. Um, what are some of the benefits I can access at the cancer center to, you know, help uh, increase the odds that the outcome is, is, is going to be less painful for me? You know, uh, Stephanie, I mean, just with Chris's consideration with, with cannabis and CBD, the idea that of or of treating pain after it happens, the idea of optimizing before surgery is, although sounds um, um, pedestrian that should happen all the time, the reality is one where how do we optimize patients uh, and how that has fallen short to a certain degree. Um, I would say that there are several uh, thoughts regarding physical therapy and what's called prehabilitation, or really preparing and optimizing patients in their physical ability prior to having a surgery. Surgery in and of itself is a very taxing uh, experience, and for some surgeries more expansive and, and profound than others, it, it's certainly preparing the body uh, for surgery, whether it be by physical therapy or even with psychological assessment that is not really, it's suggesting what are my expectations for the surgery? Um, what are, what are um, the surgeon's expectations, the care team's expectations? Um, once I align my expectations, what will be my coping mechanisms? How will I be able to, to react in a scenario where things are successful, where they're less than what I expected? Can I prepare for these various outcomes in a form of what's called almost a mindful conditioning of the mind prior to going to surgery? And pain psychology can offer these uh, elements um, to preparation in addition to physical therapy as we kind of prepare the body, prehabilitate the body uh, prior to surgery. And physical therapy as well as some of the elements that we can um, order for patients prior to surgery. It's good to know. And after surgery, going through um, the aftermath of, let's say, treatment, do you often see patients um, get sedentary and um, stop doing the exercising or take the steps they need to become more mobile and I imagine that helps with the psychology of recovery as well as the physical um, getting getting back into shape. Absolutely. Um, you know, back when Jack LaLanne, for those people that remember, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, kind of really thinking about exercise in general, um, you know, there was the first element. Of course, then we had several other folks, even Richard Simmons, that brought it into light, lots of entertainment. But the reality was is that America in general was sedentary. And and that um, we can't uh, expect that, um, that that phenomenon won't be present for our patients or our cancer pain, our cancer patients um, that are going through this journey. So, how do we, one, prehabilitate and still some of that strategy of exercise early and then plan for um, what types of physical therapy are necessary afterwards? Um, so there are unique types of physical therapy that can be helpful. Let's take, for example, after potential injury, um, maybe the surgery was certainly successful. Cancer was removed, and now the patient's in remission. But they had surgery to the pelvis and radiation to the pelvis. And in the in the woman, in the woman, that um, as well as the man, but in the woman, it's very difficult in the scenario that um, uh, all the, the the vital structures in the pelvis, um, pelvic related pain post surgery and radiation. So there is pelvic floor physical therapy that's dedicated post-radiation strategies that we work uh, with and in conjunctly with the um, uh, physical therapist, even to the point where we'll have patients that have had 
many years of remission, continue to work with a physical therapist to assist with some of the tissues and structures that have been exposed to radiation that need consistent physical therapy. Um, oftentimes, we will provide compounded specialized therapies with suppositories, whether it be rectal, vaginal, to assist with the pelvis, even Botox injections to pelvic floor muscles, and even that stimulator that I mentioned to you that can be utilized uh, to disguise pain from the pelvis itself. All of these things are with the express goal and intent of bringing back people's lives, bringing back their ability to make choices, engage in activities that bring them pleasure and relate to their family and friends, uh, and not preoccupy them with their, their previous treatment and condition. Well, when patients want to access um, some of what you do, I mean, are your services automatic or do they need to, do patients need to speak with their oncologist in order to gain access to the pain management options? Almost invariably, Chris, we, we ask that they talk with their oncologist. The oncologist is a steward of their care and has always been kind of the shepherd and uh, um, he or she can evaluate the patient, find out that, you know, maybe this is something that you need to see pain management and cancer pain management and we'll look for that referral. Um, it helps the oncologist because oftentimes many, many years ago, the oncologist was left to treating all of the pain conditions as well as the very uh, complex um, uh, requirements of oncologic care. And this allows them to focus on that complexity of oncologic care and send the patients that have these other concerns to us. Anything else you would like to touch on, Dr. Copenhaver? You know, um, I would say that in all the years in my experience that this is a time where I'm an unbridled optimist. And um, this kind of comes from the fact that as we've built kind of a structure of increasing quantity of life, we're now at the point where we can really match it with quality. And that's the goal of this kind of a conversation. The objective is how do we meet both in this gap where maybe quality hadn't met quantity and that's where we are. So um, I am uh, super grateful to both of you to have me on the podcast today and, uh, and look forward to any future podcasts. We're very fortunate uh, to have your uh, skills and ability, Dr. Copenhaver, and your compassion. Um, it, it really comes through. I, I imagine you've seen uh, a lot of patients over the years and, uh, you know, it takes a multidisciplinary approach, and that's what we have here at the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in with us today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us directly at beatcancer at ucdavis.edu. Beat Cancer is a production of the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. For more information on our NCI-designated Comprehensive Cancer Center, please visit health.ucdavis.edu slash cancer.